Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the 8th District of Massachusetts, Congressman Joseph Kennedy. Thank you all very, very much. I know that that applause is not just for the congressman from the 8th Congressional District. But a lot of that applause comes from you, comes from your hearts, because of your love for my father, and my uncle. And on behalf of my mother, who is sitting with you tonight, and all of my brothers and sisters, I want to say, my mother, she's standing up. Can my mother stand up over there, please? This is Robert Kennedy. On behalf of my mother and all of my brothers and sisters, I want to thank each and every one of you. And I want to thank most particularly Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Ron Brown, for the deep honor that they have bestowed on our family by taking the time to recognize the contributions of Robert Kennedy this evening. Many. Many of you in this room are very much a part of the events that made up my father's life. You share with my family memories of him, some of them which the film we are about to see will bring to mind. Memories not just of his love for all of us, which he gave so abundantly, but memories that each and every one of you shared Many of you in the 1960 campaign when he worked so far hard on behalf of his brother, John Kennedy. Many of you... Many of you in 1964, when this organization honored him after the loss of his brother, and many of you again in 1968, in his last campaign. But there were also people in this great city and in this great state that honored him in 1964. And for each and every one and resident of New York City and New York State, we want to say a great big thank you and a great big hello from all the Kennedys tonight. You know, he had a faith in God and a faith in our country. His clear thinking was, was such that he was not content to analyze problems or to just give speeches. He took clean action. He had a way of coming about these issues that I think caught the spirit and the mood of this, the people of this country. 
what Robert Kennedy tried to do with his life was say that each and every individual in this country counted and that he went from all of the different parts of our nation. He went to Appalachia. He went to all of the migrant farms in California. He went and he touched He touched people of poor white backgrounds. He touched people of Oriental backgrounds. He touched people all across this nation because he wanted an inclusive society. He wanted a nation that not only stood for something in our Constitution and in our Bill of Rights, but he wanted a people that would stand together and firmly take on the challenges of our time. You know, when Robert Kennedy was alive, he took on the major unions of this country, and he said that the union movement in America should stand up for the rights of working people. And if that meant... <clears throat> if that meant making enemies of Jimmy Hoffa, then he was willing to do it. And today we see Ron Carey taking over the Teamsters Union 30 years after that union was corrupted and 30 years after his work paid fruition. And we see the kinds of challenges that our country today faces. When we see the corrupt individuals, you know, we hear so much talk from our uh, moral leaders in Washington, D.C. that talk to us about the fact that what we need in America is some kind of new morality. But that new morality tells us that, when we, can, that we can condemn poor black looters in Los Angeles. But we should somehow remain silent when looters such as Michael Milken steal seven times as much money as poor blacks in Los Angeles. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, that we recognize that Robert Kennedy would have spoken out on what are today called family values and what are today called the moral values of our time. For the Republican administration to stand up and call their country club values the values of America is just plain dead wrong. There are an awful lot of there are an awful lot of plain working people that Robert Kennedy spent his blood and his sweat and his tears trying to represent. And those ordinary people in America are the voiceless. Those ordinary people of America don't have the rich, fat cat lobbyists that so often represent special interests in Washington, D.C. And, <clears throat> and I just want to say again, on behalf of our family, that the film that we are about to see, I think captures the spirit and the mood that my father tried to make a difference in this world. He tried to let each and every one of you know that you can make a difference. And for the difference that you're making in the lives of each one of us tonight, for the difference that Al Gore and Bill Clinton can make in the lives of so many mi millions of vulnerable American children, we all want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, your president, my president, America's president, Jimmy Carter. Thank you very much.
My name. My name is Jimmy Carter. And this year, I'm glad I'm not running for president. It is an honor to be invited to speak at this great convention. Each year since 1980, I've been gaining in stature and an appreciation for the party. And tonight, I'm glad to be here, even if it is the same time as the All-Star Game. Let me ask you a question before I start. What do you think of my governor, Zell Miller? Well, I think Thank you, Georgia. I think I should tell you that I am enjoying my involuntary retirement, and I note and hope that President Bush will share the same pleasure after January. Tonight, tonight, as a former president of the United States, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about some things that are very important and of deep concern to me. There is a life after the White House, one that gives me and my wife, Rosalind, a good perspective, not shared by many people, of what is happening around the world. We build a few habitat houses every year, but but we spend most of our time at the Carter Center in Atlanta. We work with others, many volunteers in many nations, without regard to partisanship, to immunize the world's children, and to eradicate crippling disease, to increase food grain production among starving people, and to address some of the most serious human rights violations. With experts and with dozens of college students, we monitor all the world's conflicts. And when appropriate, we seek to resolve them, either through direct mediation or the holding of free and democratic elections. We have visited more than 60 nations in order to meet with political leaders, farmers, teachers, doctors and nurses, human rights activists like those you've just heard, environmentalists, and others who share our common concern about the world and its future. We see, in many cases, what is happening, and we look at it from a very important point of view. Americans and others around the world see this as a unique time in history. The extraordinary policies of Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Havel, Walensky, and other heroes behind their own country, behind their own cur curtain, have made it possible for our historic commitment in this country to prevail. But new freedoms have been tempered with increasing violence in Eastern Europe and in other lands. We are now the only superpower. But we Americans do not feel triumphant because neither we nor the people of other nations have yet realized our hopes and our dreams for a new era of peace, the alleviation of suffering, 
or sustainable development. They are now, there are now 35 major wars in the world. Hard for us to believe the most in history. The suffering in these civil conflicts is indescribable and is largely ignored in the industrialized nations. The world cries out for a peaceful resolution of conflict. But our country is seen as more warlike than peace-loving. We celebrated a great victory over tiny Grenada and later invaded Panama, where hundreds of our friends were killed. We promoted and financed the Contra War that caused 35,000 casualties in Nicaragua. There are even second thoughts about the Gulf War, where Saddam Hussein still reigns supreme in Iraq, where Kuwait, <laughs> where Kuwait is no closer to democracy, and the Kurds and other refugees endure terrible hardship. We American taxpayers now hear that we helped to finance the Iraqi war machine both before and after the invasion of Kuwait. In none of these cases, in none of these cases was Camp David or any other venue used to avoid conflict. Let me tell you, let me tell you that our country should seek greatness in peace, not war. All nations share our concern about the environment. Just two years ago, Two months ago, I was in Japan working with leaders from every continent to prepare for the Earth Summit. There were hopes of success, but later in Rio de Janeiro, we saw America embarrassed as other nations marshaled international forces for our collective well-being, while our nation stood out as a primary obstacle to a better world. has got to change. The world is concerned about nuclear proliferation. Here again, the United States of America is a major obstacle to a comprehensive worldwide test ban on nuclear explosives. Our threats, our threats against Pakistan, North Korea, Iraq, and Libya have a somewhat hollow ring when our western deserts still shake with nuclear explosions. At the Carter Center, we work with victims of oppression, and we give support to human rights heroes. They all watch America, which used to set the most vivid standards of equality and hope for minorities and for women. Lately, however, it seems that the forces of our own Justice Department and right-wing federal judges are in opposition to the basic rights of those who are oppressed. America, America should be the champion of human rights at home and human rights throughout the world. The gap, the gap between rich and poor Americans has reached an all-time high. A dwindling number of our neighbors have adequate health care, decent houses, job opportunities, safety in their homes and streets, or hope for the future and the situation is getting worse. 
With federal funding slashed to the bone, for instance, there are now 10 times as many homeless people in Atlanta, Georgia, as there were when I left the White House. Violent crimes, violent crimes among juveniles have increased 300% in just the last five years. Their lack of hope for a better life seems to be equal among American leaders, those in the White House, the Congress, governor's mansions, mayor's offices, corporate boardrooms, and even university campuses have come to doubt that anything they do can make a difference in crime, juvenile delinquency, drug addiction, homelessness, or unemployment. I do not believe that the hopelessness is justified, and this country must do something about it. Increasingly concerned about the plight of, of families in our inner cities, we at the Carter Center have now embarked on what we call the Atlanta Project. We want to prove that somewhere in God's world, the suffering can be alleviated. We are marshalling public and private resources into a coordinated team and giving maximum control of this effort to the people and the families in need. Now, Atlanta is a wonderful city prosperous, progressive, and blessed with good race relations. But there are two Atlantas. I've been governor and president of these same Georgia neighbors, but my recent visits among them has been an education to me. I've learned why many pregnant women will not seek prenatal care, why one-fourth of all the public housing apartments are boarded up and unused despite a long waiting list for occupancy. I visited a middle school where the primary problem with young boys is that their measure of success in life, their achievement of stature among their peers is to own a semi-automatic weapon. I've learned that the pregnancy rate was highest in the lower grades among girls because the pimps and the drug pushers prefer sex with the little ones who are cheaper, less able to defend themselves, and less likely to have AIDS. I've visited hut villages with homes the size of minibuses, where one resident was trying to teach the others how to read. Another had helped the neighbors to build their houses, and they rotated the boiling of water from street sewers, and then shared it equally with the other families. They were not furnished running water or portable toilets in hopes that they would move out of the neighborhood. This is a great city in America and not the slums of Haiti, Bangladesh, or Uganda. And this has got to change. There are some who justify or excuse the harsh lives of the poor with claims that they are lazy or lack ambition or care little about family values. These statements are false, either based on ignorance or racism or are deliberate attempts to divide Americans one from another for political gain. Rosalind and I have gotten to know these people, these poor people, personally, both in the Atlanta Project and where volunteers work with families to build their decent homes. Given a chance for a better life, we find them to be just as ambitious, just as willing to work, and just as concerned about their children and grandchildren as we are. Within. 
Within two weeks, after moving into a new house, families that have not had high school graduates in three generations, we see choosing colleges for their children to attend. We Americans are proud of our country, the greatness of our achievements, and the nobility of our ideals. But we've lost confidence in leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, whose goals are not clear or noble, and who often seem to be shaped by political expediency and, best, and based on yesterday's public opinion polls. There is little evidence of cooperation either way in Washington as we struggle with domestic crises. The persistent underestimation of our citizens helps to explain why Americans are concerned about the future and alienated from the political system. But I tell you that it is not the system that is at fault. With new leadership in Washington, confidence in our government can be restored. It is, it is possible for the White House and the Congress to work as a team. Sound budgets can be produced. Our leaders can be truthful. Our nation can exalt peace as more noble than war. America can be, once again, the champion of human rights, of global environment, and nuclear nonproliferation. We can, once again, be the nation of freedom, progress, and hope if we have a change in Washington. There is only one voice, there is only one voice that can speak for America clearly and with conviction. And Bill Clinton, when he is in the White House next year. Thank you very much. Chairman Ron Brown, you've done a difficult job well. You brought down barriers. Your work makes us proud. We must not take the genius of Ron Brown for granted. Give Ron Brown a great round of applause. <laughs> President Bill Clinton, you have survived. You have survived a tough spring. It will make you stronger for the fall. With your stripes, you must heal and make us better. The hopes of many depend upon your quest. Be comforted that you do not stand alone. And now that it looks like you are going to win the race in November, people are already lining up outside of your hotel to get a job on appointment. Just remember when you get to the White House that I put Hope Arkansas on the map by saying keep Hope Arkansas alive all over America. <laughs> Vice President Al Gore, In years past, the Republicans would always talk about a stature gap. But this time around, they have a vice president who cannot spell potato. And our candidate can spell fluoro, fluoro, carbo, anti-disestablishmentarianism at the same time, Al Gore. <laughs> I want to thank Al Gore for his work as an environmental leader, a supporter of social justice, and original sponsor of DC statehood.
we stand as witnesses to a pregnant moment in history. Across the globe, we feel the pain that comes with new birth. Here in our country, pain abounds. We must be certain that it leads to new birth, another tragic miscarriage of opportunity. We must turn pain to power, pain to partnership, and not pain to polarization. The great temptation in these difficult days, racial polarization and economic injustice, is to make political arguments black and white and miss the moral imperative of wrong and right. Vanity asks, is it popular? Politics asks, will it win? Morality and conscience ask, is it right? We are part of a continuing struggle for justice and decency. Links in the chain that began long before we were born and will extend long after we are gone. The history will remember us not for our positioning, but for our principles. Not by our move to the political center, left or right, but rather by our grasp on the moral and ethical center of wrong and right. We who stand with working people and poor have a special burden. We must stand for what is right, stand up to those who have the might. We do so grounded in the faith that that which is morally wrong will never be politically right. But if it is morally sound, it will eventually be politically right. When I stand here tonight and look into your faces, I hear the pain and see the struggles that prepared the ground that you stand on. We've come a long ways from where we started a generation ago, it seemed, in 1964. Fannie Lou Hamer from Sunflower County, Mississippi. <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer had to fight even to sit in this convention. Tonight, 28 years later, the chair of the party is Ron Brown from Harlem. The manager is Alexis Herman, an African-American woman from Mobile, Alabama. We've come a long way. And yet, we are more interdependent than we realize. Not only African Americans benefited from the movement led by Dr. King for justice, it was only when African Americans in the South were free to win those seats could Bill Clinton and Al Gore from that same South take this rostrum to lead our country into the next century. Tonight, we face another challenge. 10 million Americans unemployed, 25 million on food stamps, 35 million in poverty, 40 million have no health care. From the coal miners in Big Stone Gap, West Virginia, to the loggers and environmentalists in Roseburg, Oregon, from displaced textile workers in my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina, the plants closing in Van Nuys, California, pain abounds. Plants are closing, jobs leaving on a fast track, more working for less, trapped by repressive anti-labor laws. The homeless are a source of national shame and disgrace. There is there is a harshness to America that comes from not seeing and growing mindless materialism. Our television sets bring the world into our living rooms, but too often we overlook our neighbors. It was there in Hamden, North Carolina. 25 workers died in a fire at Imperial Foods. More women than men, more white than black. They worked making chicken pots in vats heated to 400 degrees with few windows and no fans. The owners locked the doors from the outside. The women died. He said he locked the doors because they may steal some chicken wings. 
These women died trapped by economic desperation and oppressive work laws. One woman came up to me after the fire and said, Reverend Jackson, I want to work. I don't want to be on welfare. I have three children and no husband. She said, I plucked 90 wings a minute. Sometimes I can't bend my wrist. I catch it's this carpal thing, talking about the carpal syndrome. And then when we get hurts and can't bend our wrists, then we can't get no medical care. And then the ungrammatical profundity shares, and then they fires us, cause we cripple. And then they called us lazy bitch. And she began to cry. And I said, you are not lazy, and you are not bitch, and you are not alone, and a change is coming. We stand with you. Her friend, her friend, a white woman, came up to me and said, let me have your other shoulder. I'm seven months pregnant. We're standing two inches of water with two, with two five-minute bathroom breaks a day. Sometimes we can't hold our water, and then our bowels break, and then we faint. We wept together. If we keep Hamlet, North Carolina, in our hearts, and before our eyes, we will act to empower working people. We will protect the right to organize and to strike. We will empower workers. We will empower workers to enforce health and safety laws. We'll provide the national health care system a minimum wage sufficient to bring workers out of poverty and pay parental leave. We must build a movement for economic justice across this nation. This land is our land. Tonight, we face a difficult challenge. Our cities have been abandoned, farmers forsaken, children neglected, floods in Chicago, fires in Los Angeles. They say they cannot find $35 billion to our mayors, but the latest down payment for SNL bailout thieves is $25 billion. If we can find the money to bail out SNL thieves, we can find the money to bail out American cities. My brothers and sisters, it's time to rebuild America. And I made the quiet reason judgment to support this ticket. I did a sound analysis. Four years ago, we fought for a program to reinvest in America, paid for by fair taxes on the rich and savings from the military. This year, Governor Bill Clinton has taken a substantial step in that direction. He's expressed democratic support for D.C. statehood. More people live in Washington than five states. We pay more taxes than 10 states. We had more youth in the Persian Gulf than 20 states. We deserve the right to vote. He supports on-site same day registration and furthermore, Paying, willing to pay to retrain workers that they might pay their fair share of taxes. We must build upon that tradition. The Rainbow Coalition has added another dimension. 
there are $3 trillion in private and public pension funds. We've joined with Felix Royenton. We've used pension monies to help prop up South Africa and the moral use of the money. We've used it to leverage buyouts to build buildings that are now vacant. We can use over 10 years secured $500 billion of the workers' money with workers' consent, add another $500 billion, a 10-year trillion-dollar plan. Let's put America back to work. We can build a national railroad where we lay the bed and make the steel and lay the rail and drive the cars and build the cars and connect America, small towns, big towns, in the efficient. Let's put America back to work. Not welfare, but our share and job share. Put America back to work. Our vision, our vision must correspond with the size of our problem. Today, there is no Russian empire to fight. Use that money to rebuild our nation. There's hope in the world tonight. In Israel, Prime Minister Rabin's election is a step toward greater security and peace for the entire region. Ben's wisdom in affirming negotiation over confrontation and land for peace and bargaining table over battlefield has inspired hope not only for democratic Israel but on the West Bank as well. Israeli security and Palestinian self-determination are inextricably bound. There must be a new Middle East where Israelis and Palestinians can live together as brothers and sisters and not die apart in war after war after war after war. With stable partners like Mubarak in Egypt and King Fahad in Saudi Arabia and Boutrous Ghali at the UN, peace is on the way in the Middle East that all the talk stop about driving Jews into the sea or driving Arabs from the land. Let's stop war talk and let's have peace talk. Let's have peace in that region. In Africa today, democracy is on the march. Under President Bob Gita, successful elections were held just last week. But democracy cannot flourish amid economic ruins. Democracy protects the right to vote, but not the right to eat. Today, uh, President Duf of Senegal, who heads the Organization of African Unity, they are pushing for democracy. But just as there was a Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe and Japan, let it apply to Africa as well. Let's wipe out hunger and starvation all over the world. Make the world a peace and justice for everybody. As Democrats, it's not our mission just to fight for the political center, but the moral center. We cannot become isolationists. We must reach out. Let us not forget, in 1939, 900 Jews left Germany coming to America for freedom. They got within Miami Beach, Florida, eyesight. U.S. authorities turned the 900 Jews, most of women and children around on the ship called the St. Louis. They got back to Germany. Hitler killed them and said to them, no one would accept you. It was anti-Semitic and wrong to lock them out. But guess what, 1942, you saw young Krista Yamaguchi skating to glory in the Olympics a few months ago. Her mother was born in an American concentration camp. 120,000 Japanese Americans locked up while they fought to help us win the Second World War. If it were wrong and anti-Semitic to lock 
the Jews out in 1939 if it were wrong to lock the Japanese Americans up in 1942, it's wrong to lock the Haitians out in 1992. remains a terrorist state. Sanctions should be reimposed until there's an interim government established in South Africa. Lastly, there's a lot of talk these days about family values. Even as we spurn the homeless on the street. Remember, Jesus was born to a homeless couple outdoors in a stable in the winter. Jesus was the child of a single mother. But Mary said, Joseph, when, when Mary said Joseph was not the father, she was abused and questioned. If Mary had aborted the baby, she would have been called immoral. If she had the baby, she would have been called unfit, without family values. But Mary had family values. It was Herod, the quail of his day, who put no value on the family. When, when Dan Quayle tries to ride both sides of this private, religious, moral issue, he is above his potato. <laughs> above all, Democrats, we must reach out to our children. Our children are in trouble. They are embittered. They were not born that way. They live amidst violence and rejection. They live in broken streets, broken glass, broken sidewalks, broken families, broken hearts, their music, their rap, their video, their art reflects their broken world. And yet, these are our children. For many of them, I say to you, jail is a step up. We spend in Los Angeles on those children to go to a high school, but Congresswoman Maxine Waters and I stayed with them in the Imperial Courts and Nickerson Gardens. Those children cannot imagine a health insurance package. They cannot imagine applying to go to college. They cannot imagine a job. We spend on them to go to high school, 5,000 a year. But the downtown jail, 34,000 a year. For them, jail is a step up. But once they are jailed, they'll no longer be hit by drive-by shootings. Once they are jailed, they're no longer homeless. Once they are jailed, they have balanced meals. Once they are jailed, it's warm in the wintertime. It's cool in the summertime. Once they are jailed, they have adult supervision. We must reach out to our children better than we have clean hearts and dirty hands than to have dirty hearts and clean hands. These are our children. These are our children. These are our children.
these are our children. And I say this to you tonight as we proceed toward November. In all of this ugliness, there is hope. There is still that silver lining in the clouds. Let us not forget, we talk a lot about Rodney King and how the white police beat him and why the, how the white jury freed them and how racist that was and it was. But lest you forget, unless a white man named George Halliday with a sense of conscience and instinct had not George Halliday filmed the beating and made it public. Tonight, Rodney King would be in jail, accused of assaulting police officers. He is an, a genuine point of light. Fellow Democrats. Fellow Democrats, fellow Americans, on behalf of our family, I thank you for this tribute to Robert Kennedy, gone now nearly a quarter a century, but indelible in memory, a vivid fire that still lights the best and most honorable paths of public life. Those who shared his hopes were a source of great strength for him. And it would be a source of great pride to both my brothers that so many of you here in this convention hall were first brought to politics by their urging and example. You are their living legacy. Their truest history is written in your hearts and in the hearts of people everywhere who refuse to be content with things as they are. Today, the ideals which became part of the very fabric of their being are not simply something to remember. Their ideals ask us, beckon us, challenge us once again to do better, to give something back to our country in return for all that it has given to us. After 12 years of wintry indifference at the center of power, it is time to return to the ideal of compassion. We must end the politics of neglecting the needy and then blaming them for their pain. In the 1990s, we must make war against poverty, not war against the poor. We must trust and speak to the best instincts of our people. We must demand an America that helps the homeless, feeds the hungry, breaks the cycle of poverty, and replaces welfare with work, not because these things are easy, but because the fundamental test of our society is how it treats the least powerful among us. An America that does not care is not really America at all. Second, after 12 years of official hostility to minorities and to the majority who are women, it is time to renew the ideals of equality.
Our national journey across two centuries has been a pilgrimage away from prejudice. It is our task as Americans to be dissatisfied with discrimination. We must stand with pride and without apology for the great unfinished cause of civil rights. We must resume our progress towards a truly free society where people will no longer be oppressed or held back or held down because of the color of their skin. We must break the glass ceiling that stretches across our government and our economy so that at long last all Americans will be equal in life as well as in law. I believe that women will be a majority of the new senators elected this year. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I believe that one day women will also be a majority of the United States Senate. We are beginning to end the discrimination against women so ancient and embedded that until this generation it was hardly even noticed or named. We must refuse to go back. We must defend a woman's right to choose. We must defend family values, not by denying women's rights, but by passing family and medical leave. American workers should never be forced to decide between the job they need and the child that they love. All this is part of a long struggle to push back the frontiers of freedom. Along the way, we have learned again and again that equality is a continuing struggle and that America is a continuing revolution. This means many things, but it surely means that cabinet posts must be filled on the basis of talent, not sexual orientation. And young Americans should not have to deny who they are in order to fight and die for their country. Third, after 12 years of false prosperity, recession, and slow decline, we must restore the ideal of economic growth and opportunity for the hard-working people who are the strength and the soul of America. We are the best in the world at training bomber pilots. Why can't we be best at training people for 21st century jobs? We are the best in the world at building smart bombs. Why can't we be best at building the high technology products of the future? It is time to stop wasting our wealth on junk bonds, mergers, and speculation. Let's use our resources to reopen college doors to the daughters and sons of the middle class. Let's use our resources to reform public education without diverting scarce tax dollars to private schools. After World War II, we rebuilt Germany and Japan. Now in the wake of the Cold War, Let's rebuild our own country. And let's begin with the health of our families. 
No one is immune from sickness, and almost no one is immune from the rising cost of care. Our fight for health care goes on, and under President Clinton and Vice President Gore, we can, we will win the battle for national health insurance. We also have a stake, all of us, in the survival and revival of our cities. So let's remove the guns and crack from our streets and our schools and the poison from the air that we breathe. In the last half century, we won one of the truly fateful contests of human history. Through it all, the United States was an example and a witness to the world of what a free society can be. As others turn to us now, we should not be stumbling, adrift, uncertain of our purposes and prospects. The nation that won the Cold War should not and must not lose its own future. I just don't understand how a president, any president, can be out of ideas for action here at home. There is so much to do to continue the American journey, to be worthy of our stewardship, and to leave a better life and a better land for our children. So finally and fundamentally, after 12 years of calculated division and appeals to fear, we must return to the ideals of common vision and common purpose. Perhaps more than any other leader in memory, my brother Bobby reached across the deepest divides of American life, black activists and blue collar, suburb and city, the young students on campus who protested the war and the young soldiers drafted to fight it. He taught us that the things which bind us as one people are stronger than the things which drive us apart. That is now the greatest single obligation of this party and the greatest opportunity for our country. I could say many things here in support of Bill Clinton, but there is one thing that matters most. He has sought to heal, to oppose hate, to reach across the divides and make us whole again. With Bill Clinton, with Bill Clinton, it is time to reject the politics of slash and burn, the evil politics that makes the face of Willie Horton more important in a national campaign than the face of a hungry child. Bill Clinton understands that government should enlarge, not diminish, the hopes and expectations of an entire generation. Let others offer easy promises and then just as easily break them. Let us offer challenges which will require effort and sacrifice and which will give our country back its prosperity, its future, and its truth. I have stood with so many of you in so many great causes. The times have changed, but the ideals are the same. We have only just begun to fight. We will never give up. We will never give in. And in 1992, we are going to win. My brothers, my brothers had every gift but length of years. The years have been left to us to use them with all the inevitable setbacks to accomplish the works of peace and justice. 
So when the members of our family think of our brothers now, we think of the poet's words. What is precious is never to forget the names of those who wore at their hearts the fire center. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while towards the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. Now let us, in our own journey, give our strength for those who are weak, give our voice to those who are voiceless, give our commitment to the working families who make America work, and whatever the winds of the moment, carry high the banner of hope. Thank you. God bless you. Good evening, delegates. My name is Maxine Waters, and I'm a member of the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, and I take my job seriously. I am not known as one who vacillates or hesitates. I know what I'm doing, and I know why I'm doing it. Four years ago, I second the nomination of Jesse Lewis Jackson. Tonight, I rise to second the nomination of Bill Clinton for President of the United States of America. I believe Bill Clinton has the capacity and the commitment to provide the leadership that is so desperately needed to snatch this country from the jaws of desperation and despair that threatens us all. Too many Americans are hurting, and my own constituents in South Central Los Angeles are in deep pain. Ladies and gentlemen, their pain is my pain. The unemployment rolls are swelling. The loss of jobs is shaking the very foundation of this nation. America's cities are in great disrepair and hopelessness abounds. Thousands upon thousands of young people have literally been dropped off of America's agenda. Thousands of young African American and Latino and poor white males in our cities are hanging out on America's street corners, just chilling, as they say, languishing on the sidewalks, in public housing projects in Los Angeles, St. Louis, Detroit, Philadelphia, and right here in New York City, to name but a few of our troubled cities. These faceless men and women are not documented in any of the statistics. They are not in school. They have either dropped out or life simply stopped for them after graduation from high school. Many left the increasingly decaying buildings with dispirited teachers going nowhere with nothing to look forward to. These forgotten souls don't show up in the unemployment statistics. Many of them are now 20 to 25 years old and they have never worked a day in their lives. I know them. I understand them. They really do want to work. They want jobs. I believe Bill Clinton hears their cry and understands their pleas. I know he hears them 
because I know he has firsthand experience with poverty. Bill Clinton's mother was a single parent who struggled to do the best she could do to raise her children. Stop. Take a look, Dan Quayle. It was her love, her caring, and her strong values that will produce the next President of the United States of America. We can invest in our people. We can turn our cities around. Following the unrest in Los Angeles, President George Bush did not have the wisdom or the common sense to invite the representatives from the affected communities to join him in meetings to discuss the problem. He even tried to exclude me and my advice. Ladies and gentlemen, I crashed the party. I went to the White House uninvited. I told George Bush about my first-hand knowledge of the despair that caused my city to go up in flames. When Bill Clinton is elected, I will not have to crash the White House. Bill Clinton will throw open the doors of the White House and invite all Americans to join him in partnership to solve the problems of this nation. Bill Clinton will indeed allow us and our ideas to be heard. Finally, there should be no debate about who government should assist. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, government should assist the most needy and not the most greedy. Time out for tax breaks for the rich and more taxes for poor and working class people. Our cities need attention. They are indeed in trouble, and so are many American towns and rural communities. Working men and women who never dreamed they would be standing in unemployment lines are still wondering, where did the jobs go? Wondering why they cannot pay the mortgage. Downright puzzled about their inability to purchase just basic necessities or to pay for their children's education. Bill Clinton understands what happened in America. He knows that neither George Bush nor Dan Quayle can begin to spell domestic agenda. They can't spell it. They don't care about it and they have done nothing to make the average person's life just a little bit better. But Bill Clinton has a plan. He is the only presidential candidate with solutions to America's problems. And Bill Clinton is smart enough. You know, he really is a Rhodes Scholar. He's tough enough. He defied the odds and fought his way through America's rough and tumble primaries. Bill Clinton is up to the job. Bill Clinton will stand up to the divisive forces who pit us against each other. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not urban versus suburban. It is not cities versus towns. It is not ghettos and barrios versus the rural communities. It's not black against white, men against women. We have all been let down by the politics of neglect and inattention. This administration has been mean-spirited, visionless, and valueless. But we're all in this boat together. We really can rebuild America. Bill Clinton is committed to reducing the military budget, reducing the deficit, investing in education and health care and child care and, yes, in human potential. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot wait around for Bush to develop the vision thing. We need Bush to get ready for the exit thing. It is time. It is time for George Bush to go. We cannot stand four more years of George Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Bill Clinton's time. It is Bill Clinton's moment in history. I stand before you and I proudly second Bill Clinton's nomination. I am prepared to roll up my sleeves and get busy. I'm going to vote and I urge you to exercise your right to make a difference by casting your vote for the very next president of the United States of America, Bill Clinton.